All right, we're in the book of Joshua. Believe it or not, I've got this sermon and one more, and we'll be finished with the, the series on Joshua. And I know you're wondering, what about the, the rest of the book? There's a lot of things that happen in the book of Joshua. Lots of land that gets taken, lots more battles to be fought. But I really want to focus today, again, on getting us into this battle that the battle that belongs to the Lord. Last week I preached about two of the seven nations. Today I'm going to preach about five more of them. So get ready. I'm going to preach five sermons. You get credit for five sermons today. Now that doesn't mean you can skip a church for four weeks, but you're going to get five mini sermons. Remember where we're going. Do that with me. God is moving us from the land of not enough through the land of just enough into the land of more than enough. So more than enough living is this, this battle that we're fighting against the enemy that are in the land of more than enough. And really what we're experiencing in our life today is not when we talk about the land of more than enough, not heaven. Heaven you don't have to fight for. Heaven is a land that we will not have any enemies in it. But this is talking about how living the Christian life means living with enemies that we face, but experiencing victory and triumph through Jesus Christ. The battle belongs to the Lord. So all these enemies that are listed, uh, Joshua 3.10 states the mission. By this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hivite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. These seven different nations, they're tribes, they're, they're scattered around this promised land in many different areas of the promised land. And each of them have unique characteristics. Each of them have unique problems that are the battles that we face. And God wanted to dispossess all of them because of the wickedness, the perversion, and, and really the contagious corruption of each of these nations. So God said he wanted Joshua and the nation of Israel to wipe them out because he wanted them no longer to have influence on the nation of Israel. Now these battles that Joshua fought are historical battles. They're battles that they actually fought and won. Some of them, they kept fighting them for years, even battles that occurred in the book of Judges and all the way up to the time of David. But these are also personal battles. Amen. They're battles that we all face individually. They're cultural battles. We see these battles in our own culture. And they're spiritual battles. They're battles that we will have to face in the spiritual. But we have the ability to have victory. We, in heavenly, arm, in heavenly army, we enter, we enter the land. We can have victory through what Jesus has done. We can't eliminate all of these enemies in the world around us. But we can defeat these enemies in our own individual lives through the power of God. So God can help us to have victory. Remember what Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Remember, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? So we have the ability within us to find victory and to defeat these enemies. But we're all going to face them at some time in our life. Last week, we did the Canaanite, the spirit of discontent. They were greedy. And we did the Hivites, the spirit of deception. I want to start today with Joshua chapter 10 and read verses 1 through 8. Joshua 10, verses 1 through 8. Now it came about when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and had utterly destroyed it just as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were within their land, that he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. Therefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent word to Hoham, king of Hebron, and to Piram, king of Jarmuth, and to Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the sons of Israel. So the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, 
the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered together and went up, and they with all their armies camped by Gibeon and fought against it. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So Joshua went up with Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the valiant warriors. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. The Amorites represent the spirit of defiance, pride, and rebellion. The Hebrew meaning of the word Ammonite is mountaineer. They were proud, boastful, arrogant. They thought they were invincible. They thought they could defeat everyone. They were the ones who, it says in Joshua 10, 8, that, that God said to them, don't fear them. Don't be afraid of them because they're not as powerful as they think they are. Satan personifies this defiance. If you look at uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, there is a statement where Isaiah is quoting what happened whenever Satan fell. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will make my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. Those were the failing words of Satan. That pride, that rebellion, that defiance against God set the stage for the fall because Satan fell long before man fell. And so that defiant spirit has been alive and well on our planet ever since then. Think about Alexander the Great who wanted to rule the world. He wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. And then think about people like uh, Charlemagne and, and Genghis Khan and Nero, and Julius Caesar, and also the Napoleon Bonaparte, and Hitler, of course. These were great men who all they wanted to do was defy everyone and rule the world. I think in some ways we have some guys that are really on that same program. I think Putin, for a lot of reasons, and she would like to rule the world if we, were not in, in, if we weren't in the way they probably would try to rule the world. But that defiant spirit that desire to rule the world, that pride spirit is even alive and well, even in a small child. Now, this will surprise you, but I know a lot of people don't believe in sin nature. But the truth is, you can see sin nature in a little child. You know, the, the truth is, you don't have to teach a little child to be bad. They're bad naturally. You have to teach them to be good. And it's hard because they're defiant. Think of the word sin. The middle letter in the word sin is I. And that's what we start out. When we start out, I, I want food. I want my diaper changed. I want to be picked up. I don't want to go to bed. We, we, we constantly start out with this I pride. It's a part of who we are in our innermost being. So pride is something that all of us have to conquer in our life. It's an enemy that we face and it even happens in the church. We have people that stand up and are prideful in the church. Now, this is something that can be defeated. The Bible teaches us in, in uh, James chapter 4, 6 through 8, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a stunning phrase in there. God is opposed to the proud. God is on the other side of the team that's proud. But I love this part where it says, if you acknowledge God and resist the devil, he'll flee from you. I heard about a little girl. She said, if the devil ever comes knocking at my door, I'm going to say, Jesus, you get the door. I'm not getting that door. And I want you to tell him to get out of here. But anyway, you know, the idea is we should be those who say, I want the devil to flee from me. Instead of me running from the devil, if I acknowledge the God and submit and resist the devil, then the devil flees from me instead of me having to flee from the devil. Pride is something that we all have to flee from. Don't be defiant. Don't be proud. Don't be an Amorite. Then let me take you to the Hittites, the defeating the Hittites, the spirit of destruction, fear, and terrorism. The Hittites were a fierce nation with great, great victories. 
They lived in the hill country and they would come out of the hills roaring and screaming and hollering. They would instill fear in the lives. Their whole battle plan was make them afraid so that they will, they will submit to our, our, our authority and our power. And that's exactly, they used fear as a weapon. And we have people today, we see that today in, in some of the fears that people face. Fear is the devil's faith. Whenever we're afraid, of something we're more afraid or we trust more in the devil's faith which is fear than we do in the faith that God gives us to stand up to those different things that we might be afraid of this spirit of fear dominates our world today think about how often fear drives so many things war terrorism we're, we're afraid of, of rising immigration issues and homelessness issues. We're afraid of politics. We're afraid of, some people are afraid of climate change. I, I don't want to say a lot about climate change, but the climate does change. I live in Norfolk. It changes all the time. But, but there is going to be global climate change. The Bible does say that the whole world is going to burn up. We sang that in a song. The whole world is going to get burned up. Climate change is going to occur. But it isn't because you're driving your car. It's going to change because God is going to come back and he's going to destroy this and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Well, that's a whole nother sermon. But people are afraid of so many things. We, you know, fear actually sells. Think about all the stuff that we buy because of fear. We, we, we put seat belts in our cars and airbags in our cars. We get smoke alarms in our house and we get, we get uh, crim, you know, alarms uh, for theft alarms in our houses. People wear bulletproof vests and they get bulletproof, you know, glass on their houses or their cars. We live with all kinds of fear. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't use safety devices. I'm not saying don't use safety devices. But don't live in fear because fear is a, it's almost the opposite of living in faith. Don't live in fear, live in faith. And what does the Bible say about fear? In uh, 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love. The word perfect is teleos. It means love that has reached its full perfection. It's when your love has may become completely mature whenever you've so fallen in love with God, when you get that much love in your heart, all of a sudden things change in your life. There's less that you're afraid of. See, I've, I think a lot of people are just not completely sure in their relationship with God. They don't have that deep love that they could have. When they do have that deep love, suddenly they realize the things that are happening around me, those must be things that God is allowing because I know that God loves me. Amen. I always say whenever bad things happen to me, I know that God loves me. It's not because God is mad at me or doesn't love me. I believe whenever bad things happen to me, God is either protecting me from something worse, preparing me for something greater, or he's pulling me closer to him. And sometimes he's doing all three of those at the same time. And I believe that you can overcome fear by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. There's another verse, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And you think about what your cares are, the things that you worry about, the things that concern you, the stresses that you have. Cast all those cares upon him. The word cast is the word hurl with abandon. It means to throw it so that you're not trying to retrieve it back. It's not like casting with a fishing reel where you cast it out there and you, you reel it back in. But that's what most people do. Most people take their fears and they throw them to the Lord. And then they say, Lord, look at this problem that I've got. And then instead of casting it to God, they, they take that fear and they fold it back up in their pocket and they go on with life and then they pull it back out again. They go, look at this that I'm, look at this concern, this fear I've got. And what God has asked us to do is cast those cares upon. She really, she really does need to repent. But she, <laughs> she, she's afraid of heights. She's afraid of water. She's afraid of drowning. Lots of things. And so the kids said, oh, mama, you got to get on the log ride with us. And she's like, that's like all of the fears, right? She's like, I'm not going to get on the log ride. And so finally they talked to her. And so she gets on the log ride and all of a sudden it begins to wiggle before it took off. And all of a sudden she remembered what our mother had taught us. 
And she said, what time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. And the thing began to wiggle some more. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. And she came, and then, then it went a cut down a couple of uh, places in the, ri the, the river that the log is on. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. She said, she said, as the ride went faster, she was faster. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. She said, when the thing went down that long wrap, you know, where, where it splashes at the end. She said, I was almost shouting. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. When she was telling me the story, she looked at me and she said, you know what? That really works. <laughs> but listen, I believe that this is something that you don't have to live with as a Christian. You know, the whole world may be afraid. We have nothing to fear. Listen, we have won. We have the victory. We have already won. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the Lord and he that is in the world we have won we have victory and you don't have to experience fear you don't have to fear the hittites and then let me give you the third one defeating the girgashites this is the spirit of duplicity and compromise you know what duplicity is it's it's being two-faced the girgashites were dwelling in the they dwelled in the clay in the marsh the word really means clay dwellers they didn't live in the hill country they didn't live in the valley or near the water. They lived in between. Not much is known about them. Some people think that they migrated to the Gadarene area. Remember the Gadarene demoniac that Jesus cast out? The one who said, I am legion for I am many. And Jesus cast that demon out. And he cast the demons out into a herd of pigs. Now get this, the Gadarene area, these people were pig farmers in a land where pork is forbidden. Talk about duplicity. They knew what they were doing was contrary to all of the law, of the people that lived around them, but they were making a living off of that. And when Jesus cast those demons into the pigs and the pigs went off and died in the water, their living, their way of living went away. So suddenly they wanted Jesus to leave town. Even the demoniac that Jesus had healed and had cast the demons out, he didn't even want to stay in the town anymore. He wanted to go with Jesus, get in the boat and go with Jesus because they were duplicitous. They were two-faced. And you've met people like this. You've met people that are one way at home and they're another way, maybe at church. Hopefully none of you painted on a smile today and you're completely different when you're at home. But that's a problem, right? Moral compromise. Duplicity, acting one way with one group of people, acting completely different with someone else. We see this all the time in our culture. Think about what happens on social media. Now, y'all may be guilty of this. I've probably done it. Don't you always have a tendency to post the best picture of you? Take 10 pictures. Choose the best one. Put that on because you want to put your best foot forward. And we do this. We do it naturally. We want, we want to appear the best we can possibly appear. But... We see it all the time in politics as well. Even, a, even sometimes a good person goes into office and they're good and righteous and all of a sudden they get in there to the state house or they get in there to Washington and suddenly everything changes. Instead of being this person with these strong moral standards, they begin to be the person who says, I got to do what it takes to get the votes. So we live in a world where this is compromised. This duplicity is a common part of our life, but it's a, an enemy that, that we can face. Romans 12, 2, Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. He, he's basically saying, don't be poured into the world's mold. Don't be pressed down in the world's mold. That, that word is a schema. It means the outward appearance. Don't be poured down into the outward appearance of the world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let what is happening on the inside show forth on the outside. Let your life so reflect what has happened on the inside that what is going on on the inside will become obvious on the outside. That's the transforming work that happens when our mind is renewed and we need to have a look to us that the world can see us and say, there's something different about you. We're to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Salt is a preservative and a flavor enhancer. It is, it's, it, it's supposed to be a, uh, an agent that you can use to, to make things right that, that would be wrong. It, it keeps meat 
from deteriorating and rotting. And we live in a world that is rotting. And Jesus has called us to be the salt in that world, to preserve it and enhance the flavor of what should be. And we're to be the light of the world. We're to let the light of Jesus Christ shine in the world so that others can see Jesus in us. God wants us to show forth our life and live out our faith. Colossians 4, 5 says, Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. We're to live our life in a way that others can look at us and see Jesus in us and not live a two-faced, duplicitous life. I remember uh, I was checking into Marine Aircraft Group 11. It's an aviation unit in the Marine Corps in San Diego. The first day I checked in, they said, uh, chaps, uh, everybody who checks in brand new has to, to give a urine sample uh, to test for drugs. And I said, okay. So I, I went down to the office where you do that, and I, was, I met all those people for the first time. Hey, I'm your new chaplain. I greeted everybody, and, and I happily uh, provided my sample. You know, Bible says God loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious <laughs> giver. So I was very cheerful. One week later, they called me up. They said, oh, this is a random kind of a sample thing, but your name came up again. You have to give another sample. One week later. So I go, and I thought to myself, well, surely if, if I tested, ne anyway, so I go and gave my, very happily, went in, greeted the guys, hey, everybody, hey, it's your chaplain, hey, great, I get to get, visit with you guys again, happily gave a second sample. One week later, believe it or not, third week, exactly the same thing. Chaps, I know you're not going to believe this, but your name came up again. So I gave my sample the third time. No kidding, four weeks in a row, the fourth week, they said, Chaplain, I don't know what's wrong with our system, but your name came up again. And I went in there very happily, and I said, listen, I know y'all see me walking around all the time, and I'm smiling, and I'm laughing, and I'm in good spirits, even when I have to give a urine sample. It's not drugs, it's Jesus. <laughs> And that was the last time I had to give a sample. For the next two and a half years, they said, don't bother, it's Jesus. <laughs> oh, listen, don't live a life of duplicity. And then let me take you to the parasites, the spirit of depravity and immorality. So the Hebrew word for parasite means open and unwalled. They were a nomadic tribe that wandered rather than dwelling in cities and building walls around the areas where they lived. Their religion was based strictly on fertility worship. So they had all sorts of sexual sin involved in their life. It was a common occurrence among the parasites. This depravity and immorality is widespread in our country today, in our world. Uh, I read an article that said 30% of the internet is now pornography, completely pornography. So bad that you have to be careful what you write in your Google searches, or you might come up with something that's pornographic. Our TVs, our movies, our even print media is filled with pornography. Immorality is widespread. The spirit of depravity is widespread in our world. And I'll tell you what I think about uh, Drag Queen Story Hour. It is the spirit of depravity, amen? amen? I mean, this is, it is amazing that we have a world in which it is impossible to think about so much. There's so much going on that is involved in this pornography. In fact, uh, sex sells. We use, still use it for all sorts of products that we sell. It's become very, very widespread. And sex is so much a part of our life that it's become a societal and a health crisis an explosion of STDs racks our world. Even, even sexually transmitted diseases that lead to death. The AIDS crisis is still with us. We don't hear about it as much. Mostly it's because there's drugs that can keep people alive, but people are still getting AIDS. It's still a terrible, terrible disease that's pervasive. In fact, the spirit of depravity is so powerful today in our world that the number one political issue of our day for more than 50% of our population is the right to abortion, the right to kill babies. I mean, think about, think about the level of depravity. The Bible says that God gave them over, in Romans 1, gave them over to impurity. God gave them over to immorality. And God gave them over to insanity. He gave them over to a depraved mind. How much more depraved would you have to be 
than to see people that are celebrating the right to kill babies. I mean, let's be honest. That's what we're talking about. We live in a world where it's very, very common for people to shout for their right to kill babies, the right to abortion. And I know that that's a political issue, but it's a moral issue more than ever. It is saying that it's okay to kill babies in the womb. Here's what I believe it is. I believe it's a spiritual issue. I believe Satan really wants to kill as many image bearers as possible because we're all made in the image of God and Satan would like to completely eliminate every image bearer. And Satan is also attacking our homes, the place where image bearers are nurtured, the, way, the place where image bearers begin to know about God and that is being attacked as well. So we live in a world of, of spiritual depravity and sexual depravity. Defeating this enemy. You know, the, the Bible's word on this is flee immorality. 1 Corinthians 6.18, Paul said, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. You know, theologians are divided over what Paul means by sinning against your own body. It's not used anywhere else in the Bible. It's a very unusual phrase. But he goes on to talk about how our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he, and he says that we have been bought with a price. So therefore glorify God in your body. So the best we can understand that verse, that a person who sins in the immoral sense, sins against their own body, is that it is as if when a person commits immorality, that because the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we have somehow united the presence of God, who is in the body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have united Him in this act of sin in a very unique way. It's a tragic thing. And I will say that Christians experience immorality. This is a problem for Christians. But it, can, it is a problem that can be solved. It is a sin that can be confessed and forgiven. It's a sin that can be cleansed from the life of a Christian, just like it can be cleansed from the life of an unbeliever before they come to Christ. So flee immorality. Whenever Joseph was faced with Potiphar's wife and she seduced him to try to give him, you know, he could have easily gotten away with that. But he fled. In fact, he fled with her holding his his clothes in his hand. He fled immorality. The thing about immorality is you can't give it a single moment. You can't allow the thought to come at all. You've heard that old line, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. It all begins with a thought. Romans 8, 6 says, the mind set on the flesh is death but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. You have to get your mind on the right things. You have to take captive those thoughts before they have a tendency to grow. My dad used to always say, you can't stop the birds from flying around above your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And the same thing is true of thoughts. You can't keep thoughts from swirling around above your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your mind. And that's really what we have to do to defeat this enemy, especially in our own lives. And then let me give you the last one, defeating the Jebusites, the spirit of discouragement and depression. The literal meaning of Jebusite is trodden down. The Jebusite lived in Jerusalem, which was not taken until the time of David, and it required no armies. There were no major battles. It was just a crumbling of the Jebusites under the authority of David. Some people say because of their discouragement, they just gave up. They gave away their land and what they held. This discouragement and depression is a global problem. I read that 18 million adults in any given year are suffering from depression, and it is the leading cause of disability for ages 15 to 44, and it's the primary reason for suicide. We have in America today 41,000 suicides per year. Compare that to homicides with only 16,000 per year. We have more people that die by their own hand than by the hand of someone else. Depression is a huge, huge problem. This depression and discouragement. How do you defeat this? 
Well, I'm not going to downplay the significance of depression. Depression is, is awful. And uh, I remember somebody saying to me one time, uh, is in my singles group, they said, Steve, how come you never seem depressed? And I said, well, because I don't like how I feel when I'm depressed. And they said, well, it's just not that simple, but I choose not to go into depression. Now, I know there's probably some psychiatrist out there, a psychologist that says you can't just decide. But the Bible says that we can encourage ourselves. There's a verse here in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. After the Amalekites had taken over David's, his family, taken his family away, defeated the city, burned the city. David comes back to the city, he and all his warriors, and find his family gone and his city burned. And the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself. In fact, did you know that you can talk to your soul? Psalm 42, 5 says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? He's talking to his own soul. Why have you become despair? Why have you become this way in your own soul? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. You can encourage your soul. David overcame that depression, that source of, of downgrading, downtrodden, by encouraging himself. He chose to say, I am not going to live with discouragement. I believe you can do that. I believe as a Christian. I'm not convinced people that don't know Christ can experience that level of encouragement. I don't know if a non-believer can just encourage themselves, but I know that a believer can if you put your faith and trust in Jesus because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We live in a world that's filled with this kind of discouragement and despair. But I believe as a Christian, you can overpower it. You can be more powerful than it. I'm going to close with this. There's a story. You've probably heard this story already. But there was a farmer who had a mule who stumbled into an old abandoned well and fell all the way to the bottom of this well. The mule's down in the bottom of the well, so deep the mule couldn't get out. He called around some of the experts in the area and every one of them looked down. They said, there's no equipment. There's nothing we can do for this mule. The only thing you can do for this mule that is humane is get a bunch of guys with shovels and get a bunch of dirt and fill in the well and put the mule uh, out of its misery by letting the mule die. So this old mule down in the bottom of the well and I could just hear the mule. Eow, eow, eow. And the guys gathered with their shovels and they began to shovel the dirt into the hole. And as they began to shovel the dirt into the hole, I think that old mule all of a sudden got very, very smart. And that mule said, you know what? If I just stay right here, I'm going to be covered with dirt and I'm going to die in the bottom of this hole. So that mule, whenever the dirt began to fall, that mule began to shake off that dirt and step up. Each time another pile of dirt came up, the mule shook off the dirt and stepped up. It continued. They continued to shovel dirt. The mule kept shaking it off and stepping up, shaking it off and stepping up until eventually that mule stepped right up out of that hole because it shook it off and stepped up. And that's what we have to do. Sometimes all you can do is say, OK, everybody keeps piling on stuff that's going to bury me ultimately, but I'm going to shake it off and I'm going to step up. I'm shaking it off and step it up. And I hope that's what you will do as a Christian. You can have the power over discouragement and depression. And I, listen, as I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking about you all. And I, was thinking, I wonder if there's anybody in this congregation has any problems with depression and discouragement. I bet you there's somebody here who does. I wonder if there's anybody here who ever faces fear. I bet you there's somebody here who does face fear. I wonder if there's anybody here who faces any of these other issues that I face. I bet you that somebody's here. Somebody is involved in this. And I believe that you can have the victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. You can't defeat this, these enemies in all the rest of the world, but you can defeat these enemies in your own life through God's help. You can do this. You can have victory through Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we just pray that as we close this service, Lord, we pray for those who need to hear this word, that today is a day they need to step up and say, I'm not going to be defeated. I'm going to be victorious through what Jesus has done in my life. God, I pray that this would be a transforming experience in the life of believers today. And Lord, I pray for those who are here today who maybe have never trusted in you as Lord and Savior. They've never experienced victory because they've lived without the power of Jesus Christ in their life. Lord, I pray that today would be a day 
they could say yes to you and give their heart and life to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.